I love technology. In fact, I use it every day to figure out the quickest way to get to work. I use it so that my family can know where I am as I travel the world. I even use it to remotely set the temperature in our home before I get home. As a professor for the last 20 years in mechanical and biomedical engineering, I have taught engineering, science, and design to students all with the intent of them designing the future of advanced technologies. Think about technologies that you have. You have computers, smartphones, smart TVs, smart watches. You probably have a tablet on you. You have something in your pocket. You have it at home. You have it in your office. And more and more, we're having it in our cars. We almost can't get away from it. So my question is this, does all that technology really make our life better? We have apps to help us with our diet, and that doesn't necessarily mean we eat better. We have apps to help us with our finances, and that doesn't mean we save more money. We even have apps to help us with our calendar coronation. And it doesn't help me get to my meetings on time. <laughs> so while technology is important, and I would actually say essential in today's life, I think there's a part of technology that deceives us. To help you understand how I came to that conclusion, I want to take you back to the early 1970s. As a boy growing up here in central El Paso, my dad and I used to regularly cross the bridge into Juarez to go shopping and run errands. On one particular Saturday, my dad and I crossed the border to go to the Mercado, the market in central Juarez, close to the Catedral, the iconic Catholic church in the center of town. On our way from the car to the market was a young boy, and he was sitting on this corner with his hand stretched out, asking for a loose change. He was distraught and downcast, and I could tell that his hands, his face, his feet were crusted with dirt. His hair was matted down, and his shirt was torn and tattered. I noticed that this boy sat really low to the ground, because he sat on this crude cart with wheels. For one leg was amputated, and the other leg was twisted and deformed behind him. I could tell that he pushed himself on the ground because he had calluses on his hands. It was really interesting that while I had seen many people in what is begged before, this was a little bit different. Because it was a boy like me, almost looking at me like, why can't I be you? So as a probably 10-year-old boy, I looked at that situation and thought, that's a cool card. I probably wish I could write on it. I probably made some sarcastic remark, but my dad, usually a very, very calm guy, picks me up from the ground, looks at me and says in Spanish, this poor boy cannot walk, for we should have compassion on him. For by the grace of God, there go you and I. Fast forward to 2003. I'm a young professor. And I decided that I would help take on one of the most pressing challenges of prosthetic development to help develop the world's first low-cost polycentric knee for the poorest of the poor who could not afford it. I had been a postdoctoral fellow at the premier Rehabilitation Institute of Chicago. And in being there, I had realized that we were developing some of the most sophisticated prosthetic technologies for the segment of the world that needed it the least. 
So I thought, let's take a difficult challenge, just take a knee joint. The farther up your amputation is, the more difficult the joints become. And I had noticed that I never had seen a polycentric, a multi-axis knee in the developing world just because of the cost. So we decided to reverse engineer the current polycentric knees out there and take all the cost out of it to make it accessible. One year later, we came up with this. This is the world's first lowest cost polycentric knee. In fact, it's been so successful that it's been mimicked and even copied by others. This knee is now made by Limbs International, a nonprofit organization based here in El Paso that I founded so we could aid the millions of amputees all over the world. We have put that knee in a box called a limb box, which contains everything you need to help an amputee with the technology needed to walk again. The cost of that entire box is less than the price of this cell phone. With that, you can make a prosthetic limb that looks like this. It has everything you need. It bends, it's adjustable, and it's repairable in the field. We have fit thousands of patients in over 35 countries in the world. But it's not about technology. It really is about people. So I want to tell you about one. I met Peter in 2004 in Kijabi, Kenya, a small town outside of Nairobi. Peter was 19 years old, and a year before that, Peter had lost his leg in a tragic accident. When I met Peter, he was distraught and downcast, for he lost his leg. And in the developing world, if you lose your leg, it's not just about losing mobility. It's about losing your way of life. Because if you lose mobility, you lose your job. And there's not the social structure that we're used to in those countries. So Peter, by that accident, automatically became a part of society that is looked down upon and often outcast just because he lost his leg. And losing his leg was the first losses of many for Peter. Because he lost his leg, he lost his job. And with the loss of his job, his girlfriend realized that he was no longer going to be able to provide for her and their possible future family, so she left Peter. Peter lost his apartment and had to move back home with his parents. Unfortunately, that is all too common occurrence for the poor around the world that lose a limb. The family takes them in, and it stretches the family's income resources to be able to care for that individual. And sometimes it gets to the point where the amputee is relegated to begging on the streets to help the family make ends meet. But fortunately for Peter, that did not happen. He had heard that there was a team in Kajabi, Kenya, that was fitting individuals with a new leg system. That's when I had met Peter, with some sense that maybe this could help him walk again. So we helped Peter. We taught him how to walk again. And over a period of time, he got a job. And a young girl took an interest in him named Rebecca, and realized that Peter could provide for their family. And she married Peter. Today, Peter and Rebecca have a three-year-old son named Kelvin. I really wish I could tell you that every story of every patient we have fitted is like Peter. But I can't tell you that. See, we had spent a lot of time with Peter, personally, teaching him how to walk, encouraging him, 
letting him know that he was not restricted to crutches, letting him know that he could build a support network for him to be able to regain his life again. Tragically, that's not true in the developing world. See, as a young professor, I thought that all I needed to do was develop this gadget and throw it into the system, and it would miraculously solve all the problems. I have seen that repeatedly as I travel the world. Technologies developed by engineers like me, meant for good, sithering, gathering dust in a corner because we haven't fully thought through the implications of that technology. How does it impact the community? How does it impact patients? How does it fit in within their cultural values? How is it economically sustainable? Thinking of an American mindset in the context of another culture doesn't always work. So I had seen that even though we had fitted thousands of patients in many, many countries around the world, that we were really falling short of the aim of what we really wanted to do is restore amputees back to their full capacity of being re-engaged with their life. So at LIMS International, we started a community-based rehabilitation program. We're working with partners in the U.S. and with partners locally in those villages, we partner with them to aid the amputee and the community so that we can get the community to rally around the amputee. Those that have a heart and are on the front lines to take ownership for those disabled in their own society because we certainly can't be there all the time. That boy that held up his hand to me in Juarez asking for my change, he had a technology in that cart. And that wasn't enough. And it shouldn't be. What that boy in Juarez needed is what this boy in Bangladesh is getting. Yes, this boy in Bangladesh got a prosthetic limb, but this boy in Bangladesh has a community that is stretching out their human hands to help him walk again. A human voice that encourages him and tells him that he is not alone. A human heart that can feel his pain and his tears so that he can laugh again, just like he's doing in that picture. We have active programs throughout Latin America and are testing a model to replicate it around the world. Think about the technology you have. Are there times where we're depending on our technology when the human element is also needed? Companies for years have said their biggest asset is not technology, it's really people, it's you and I. So as we go into the 21st century with the many grand challenges we will face, and as we think about technologies that we will develop, which will be an important part of solving those, those problems, we must not forget that it's only part of the solution. The other part of the solution is us. You and me. For it's you and I that really have to bring in and infuse the human element. Thank you. <laughs>